Psychology of Working is a perspective that I, a few colleagues and I have been thinking about for, for a number of years. It's, it's a way to include everybody in how we think about work. You see, psychologists, counselors, and many other social and behavioral scientists have typically um, focused on the work lives of people who have choice, who, have, who can make their own decisions about what they do, which is a great aspect of modern life. But the reality is most people around the globe do not have choice in what they do. They basically take what they can get. That's the case for the majority of workers around the globe. And what I felt like I needed to do was to really chart a direction for psychologists, mental health uh, workers, mental health therapists, and um, also educators, social scientists, behavioral scientists to think about work in a broader, more inclusive way. So it, it also looks at the impact that work has on our personal lives, the impact of work in, in psychotherapy and in counseling, which hasn't been dealt with that well. So I really tried to articulate a kind of inclusive, broad-ranging perspective. Actually, I've been thinking about this for about 10 or 12 years. There have been a few people in my field who've written about this, most notably Mary Sue Richardson. So I don't want to take full credit for this, and I don't do that in, in the book either. The reality is um, there have been a number of people thinking about this, people who've been looking at the work lives of people of color, of the poor, of immigrants, um, counselors and psychologists who are looking at the work lives of everybody who works, have all come to a similar conclusion that we don't really have a way of thinking about or understanding work as most people do it, as most people experience it. It has been a passion of mine. It goes back to my own personal history as well, um, that I've always felt deeply committed to trying to do something that matters in the world. Even in a, in a privileged country like the U.S., where, of course, we have pockets of poverty, but for the people here who do have privilege, um, recent research has demonstrated that most people would do things differently in their work lives. So well, people often get stuck in careers that they're forced to stay in because of economic reasons or family reasons. So I think the issue of choice, you're right, it really flows along a continuum. It's not like you either have choice or you don't have choice. Um, so I think this is relevant for even the people who work, uh, who, who have had a fair amount of education and um, access to opportunity. Work impacts people's lives in a multiple uh, set of ways. First off, um, having work allows us to survive. It gives us the means to continue our existence, food, shelter, uh, money, um, things that we could exchange for other goods and services. Work also provides us with a way of having social connections and relationships. And increasingly, that's an aspect of work that people are talking and writing more and more about. The work is really a place where we find ourselves feeling connected. And psychologists over the last 20 or 30 years have increasingly observed that we really are hardwired for social connection and for relationships. And the third thing is I think work does provide us with a way of self-determining our own future, of kind of trying to articulate what we want to do. Work in many ways is like what play is for children. I think human beings are, are, are constructed to do something with themselves. You know, if, when we were kids, we used to build little sand castles or play with blocks and build little cities. In work, we do different things, all sorts of different things, and it gives us a sense of meaning and accomplishment, as well as a sense of identity. But I think there's a natural striving for people to work, much as there's a natural striving to be curious about the world. Work in of itself, I think, is something that does give people a sense of dignity. I think that there is something inherently positive about many forms of work. There are many forms of work, however, that are denigrating, that are laborious, that are physically taxing, that can even be painful or oppressive. But I think if the environmental supports are there, if people are feeling nurtured and supported and have the skills in the area where they're working, I think work can be noble. Um, in my own personal life, my parents, neither of them had what they call glamorous jobs, but they felt very much connected to the world by being able to work. And they felt a sense of, of, of wholeness about it. Psychotherapists have not really dealt with work well. Um, if you look at most of the psychotherapy theories, you know, classic Freudian theories that people know about, you know, through reading, through the media, there's almost no mention of work at all. And this is the case currently as well. So the reality is that 
people come into therapist offices talking about work problems, but therapists don't really have a language or a set of tools to use. We are very much trained as therapists to deal with family issues, to deal with intrapsychic or internal conflicts or irrational beliefs or um, emotions that we're having trouble regulating. But therapists aren't really trained to really understand much about the context people live in. I also think that therapists have unconsciously colluded to not deal with work. And by doing so, they're also able to avoid, um, in some ways, what is the most um, vivid example of lack of equity in the world, that not everybody has the same access to opportunity. And I believe that when therapists increasingly look at work as a viable point, as a viable issue in their, in their work, in their treatment, I think that the quality of therapy will improve dramatically. The book is written um, for mental health therapists, but it's also written for, um, I think, an interested lay audience, people interested in education, people interested in, in career management. Um, I also discuss work more generally. So out of the 10 chapters, two are specifically devoted to clinical and counseling issues. The other eight are devoted to broader conceptual issues. Although each chapter, for the most part, ends with a case. And the cases are used in many ways to illustrate the points in the chapter and to make them come alive. As a therapist for years, I had clients come in to talk to me about the difficulties they had with their coworkers or supervisors. So that's a huge aspect of what we need to focus on as therapists and also as employers. I think we lose a lot of productivity among our workforce by not really managing the relational environment that well. Uh, a second issue is people who don't have a good fit with their work, with, their area, with the area where they're working, where they may not be a good fit in terms of um, personality, values, interests, things of that nature. So I th that's another area where people can feel really stagnated and depressed by their work if it's just not something they can feel connected with. I'm hoping this book will start uh, some momentum uh, so that therapists will much more readily think about work um, in a kind of conceptually rich, much more um, comprehensive fashion. The person who wrote the foreword for the book, Paul Wachtel, is a very prominent clinical psychologist who has written about social justice issues and has done some very, very important creative work in psychotherapy theory. And when I first asked him to write the foreword, I didn't know him. I just wrote him an email. He, um, and I sent him a few chapters. He replied and said, I would be honored to do this. And he said, David, you basically, you've critiqued my work, which I wasn't thrilled that I critiqued his work. I did it in a very polite way. Um, but nevertheless, there was a critique that Wachtel, like other clinicians, hasn't really dealt with work as, a, as an issue. And he took on the job of writing the forward in part so he can kind of put his two cents into this issue and really kind of get behind it. I think there's, a, there's an increasing need for therapists to, to think about, write about, and develop treatment models to deal with work issues. I tried to change the way that um, social scientists or behavioral scientists do scholarship. And what I did, which I think is different, a bit controversial, is I use memoirs, I use narratives, I use excerpts from plays, from poems, I use um, lyrics from music. I did it as a way to give voice to people who work. And I did it as a way to help the reader have um, more of an empathic connection to these issues. So in some ways, it's a different epistemology that I used in this book, which I think is interesting. And I'd like to see other people use this. I think that um, as psychologists, we have done a great job of making a very exciting feel very dull. And in doing so, we lose the ability to impact upon a broader audience. To me, these issues are compelling. These are really fundamental issues about life. Work is really a theater in which life is enacted. And I wanted the reader to really feel it, not just read about it, but to feel it emotionally. So throughout the book, I have about 80 different excerpts, uh, ranging from memoirs, ranging from uh, lyrics from Bruce Springsteen, including uh, memoirs of um, Bolivian mine workers, um, auto factory workers, um, workers in the sex industry, as well as um, higher level white collar workers managers. I think it's important for people to be aware that uh, workers have a voice and that we need to really attend to that voice and really listen to it and listen to it emotionally as well as intellectually.
There was true. one particular library that was really useful, and that was the O'Neill Library at Boston College. And uh, actually, I'll be honest, that library was fantastic for this project because um, I was so impressed with the quality of the help, and particularly with the online library, which in, in the period of four and a half years since I was working on the book, I really experienced the electronic revolution in libraries while I was writing this book. From 2001, I started the book actually September 10th, 2001, right before 9-11. And within the first year or so, I was still taking a lot of books out, getting journal articles. By the end of the uh, four and a half years of working on the book, I was doing all my work from home, downloading articles. Um, so the transformation in the way of doing this work was amazing, was, was really, um, was really mind-boggling. The other thing, uh, in terms of following up this line of work, a lot of my work has been qualitative, has been analyses of narratives. Um, there are, of course, databases, and I think it really be important for us to study databases of unemployment. I think that's a really important issue that we need to study. I would heartily recommend that scholars really look into the psychological impact of unemployment so we no longer tolerate you know, structural unemployment in our economies, which is tolerated across the Western world. I think the second thing is um, I have extensive literature in the, um, in the book, ideas in the book. I have an entire chapter devoted to future directions for research. So there's probably at least 45 dissertation ideas embedded in this. It's chapter 7. Um, and I think this, this field is ripe for scholarship. And it's also very ripe for scholarship for people who want to make a difference. This is a social justice oriented um, kind of perspective I've advocated. It's a perspective um, about trying to change the status quo and students and scholars who are interested in that kind of work will really resonate to this. Um, and in terms of doing the kind of work that I've done, having access to a good library is really, really helpful. I think in closing, the thing I want to say about this book is it was a labor of love. The people who've read it, and I, I feel very honored by the people who read it, have all said that they felt some something emotional about the writer, that, that my sensibility, my, my feelings about life and the world are all boldly evident in the book. And one of my colleagues who I uh, was really touched by this said that the book has soul. And uh, if there's anything that I tried to do was to convey, was to speak for those who haven't had a chance to speak, for, to speak for those who haven't had a chance to have their place at the, at the public policy table and was really to try to push that agenda that we need to attend to everybody who works, not just the white-collar person who could pay the high consulting fees or high therapy fees.